you are a millennial designing for a millennial and you run the largest global brand in fashion that has that, what power does it give you to be the same age and sex as your customer? I think it gives us as a brand incredible power because I'm going through the same life moments that my exact customer is going through. And if she's on the younger side of the millennial, then I know what she's about to go through. I know her struggles, I know her fears, I know you know her mentality, and I'm so much closer to it than someone who might be older and kind of designed for a different generation. So I think that ability to connect with her on that means a lot and she knows it's authentic. It's not someone trying to act young or trying to speak you know, do millennial speak. It's this is our dialogue and, and it's organic. When you look at success and failure and brands that last and stand the test of time and those that don't, talk to us about entering into the fashion world. It's a world I know nothing about. I'm just a consumer of it, but it's also a world where you guys have said was really a dictatorship. Yes. What do you mean? I think that when we first started out, there was 10 key buyers, 10 key editors, that if they deemed you uh, the right designer, the most talented, then you became part of a circle that was you know, helping each other out and pushing each other, promoting each other. And I think that we're here because of our consumer. Our consumer chose us. I began to talk to her online when no one else would. The minkettes, you've named them. We named them, well they named themselves and I, and I said, wow, there's a lot of you calling yourselves minkettes. And it was really this tribe. It was probably early crowdsourcing, the early squad of girls that were passionate, that were so appreciative that I I wasn't above them. I wasn't too good to talk to them. I was happy to hear their critiques, their needs, their wants, and really just focus on tightening that dialogue with her. And I think uh, she chose us and we're here because she keeps loving the brand. But I, I also think for a brand to keep relative today, you have to keep evolving. You can't stay still. You also were one of the first, if not the first designer. Uh, online, especially through social media, Correct. to talk directly to your consumer. And I, I had read that people called you crazy for doing it. We like, had, you don't need to engage with them, really. We had interventions. We had sit-downs with you know heads of department stores um, saying, don't talk to these people women you're that's beneath you you should be in your ivory tower and when we first started working with bloggers they were like those people those d-list celebrities those disgusting humans and we were like we actually think that there's something here and we think that this is probably how uh, fashion and storytelling and content will actually evolve so we didn't listen to them and that was very scary to not listen the first uh, fashion brand on snapchat is that right we think so. It was very empty. It was Taco Bell and us. Has it worked? What has been the net benefit to the brand, would you say? How can you quantify that for us? Because I do believe that there is, you know, a line with social media, right? I mean, you don't just want to flood the zone. You want to have an identity and something authentic. I think that for us, each time a new social platform that has emerged that had longevity, if we got on it and we began to talk to our customer and give her the type of information she wants, which is different for each platform, we began to see that it just tightened our connection to her. It tightened our ability to have her engage with us uh -huh. and stay with the brand. And we see conversion, you know, when we post something on Instagram, you know, and it's tied into a mailer. Yep. That's kind of a no-brainer, um, social media 101, but it really does convert. So maybe we call it retail 3.0 or the experience that you guys are trying to give your customer and give them in the store. Everything's different about your store. When I walk into the Soho store and when you walk into the different stores that you have, the lighting in the dressing room is different. The mirrors are different. The way you order clothing to the dressing room to try on in addition to the items you already have in there, all computerized, all led by technology. Why? I think the main goal here is we never want to use technology for technology's sake. The goal is, is what are the pain points that our consumer experiences in brick and mortar? And how do we take the best of an e-commerce experience and put it into a brick and mortar environment? So it should be that you should be able to adjust the lighting as you're buying by occasion. Or Meaning I'm going to wear this on a sunny summer day. I want to see how it looks in that lighting or I'm going to wear this out at night. Correct. You should be able to sort of look at what you're buying and say, this is the environment it's going to mimic. How does it look on me? I think you should be able to uh, tap for an associate to bring you a new style and a new color so that you don't have to get dressed and stick your head out. You are very personally committed to helping 
women, female entrepreneurs, especially in STEM, especially in the technology sector, you've partnered with Intel mm -hmm. on a pretty big program. What is it? What's the goal? So basically, it began with the smart mirrors and the lack of women at the table. And then it also became very prominent to me when we were designing the first wearables. And I was debating with the gentleman who was the chief designer about the fact that you know, the housing had to be plastic. And he said, we'll just paint it gold, she won't notice. Mm. I was like, oh yes, she will notice, and she's not buying a plastic bracelet. Um, it happened again um, when we were designing the next round of wearables, and they thought, oh, a big amulet the size of an egg will be around a woman's neck. And I said, a woman's never going to wear that. Um, and so this kept happening, and I thought, you know, if there was a woman at the table, not for the sake of having a woman to be equal, it's just a user experience, right? And, and what can happen when you unlock and you make more women at this table? Um, and it's been a declining statistic about uh, women getting to a certain level and then quitting, or even in school yeah. not finishing. You have said on this issue of equality, don't delete men from the conversation. Correct. I think there is a segment that I hear too often of women saying, uh, because they're so upset at the inequality, it's almost like, get them out of here. But you're never going to get an agreement between all parties unless you bring them along and you educate them and you show them how it's different. Mm -hmm.